How are we doing? Oh, they're better. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, so, there's Scott. Hello, Scott. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you were. Um, so, I, you know, I wanted to talk to you about something completely different. I wanted to give you guys a sense of the scope of market design as it exists in, in the auction world. And, and in the auction world, uh, the, they, the, one of the nice things about the problem that I showed you before is I wanted, first of all, it's the most exciting thing I'm doing. I'm really, I'm really excited about the work on, at the FCC. But the, the other reason for emphasizing that and putting it first is that I see it as closely connected to matching. That is, I learned about um, the techniques to use uh, some of the techniques that uh, are in there by thinking about market design more broadly, learning lessons from, uh, from matching as well as from auctions. But the, um, uh, but, but the set of questions that arise are wide, and obviously they, they go beyond just the, the, the things that come up only in matching. I showed you, for example, the SAT solving, the computational innovations. I didn't know anything about that when I started this, and I don't know whether you have anything like that that you've encountered in matching, but it seems like a very specific uh, problem for auctions. Here I want to show you, um, I chose this talk. It's a little shorter than an hour and a half, probably. Um, but I, I, I chose this talk because I wanted to show you that we do some things that are completely different. Um, this talk is, the connections between this talk and matching, I can't really tell you if there are any. Um, but it's market design for sure. It's a real market design problem. It's part of the consulting that I do. I was approached about this particular problem. One of the nice things about being a market design consultant is to get the most interesting problems. This one is, this is a really interesting problem. So it's about adverse selection. And, and um, it, here's what, oops, what I want to say. So um, I, this is the, an outline of the talk. It's really a shorter talk. I'll probably finish it in an hour. Um, and um, I'm talking about display advertising. Now, display advertising is not the same as search advertising. If you guys have have uh, paid attention to the literature. The literature that's been published, you know, you see uh, ever since the Varian and Edelman Ostrovsky Schwartz papers, the, the, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the generalized second price auction used for, uh, uh, for placing ads on the search page. Um, the people who advertise on the search page are what we call performance advertisers. That is, they're advertisers who are looking for, they want you to click. They want you to go to their website and fill out a form or buy a product or look at a video or there's some performance they want from you. And, uh, and the advertisers themselves can figure out whether they're getting good value from their ads. That is, a, a performance advertiser, I put an ad on the search page or on any page, if it's a performance ad, if people click on it, then the ad's performing. If they buy product, whatever it is I want them to do, I can measure their performance. I can tell whether the ad is working. That's not the way traditional advertising works. Traditional advertising also has ordinary brand advertisers who, I'll show you what these things look like in a while, but they put up an ad, classic brand advertiser, you don't see them much on the internet, is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola being the biggest advertiser of all. Why don't you see them on the internet? Right? The, um, so uh, Coca-Cola is a brand advertiser. What they want to do is they want Coca-Cola to be in your head so that the next time you're thirsty, you reach in the fridge and you grab a Coke. You know, or the, the uh, uh, they're not looking for immediate performance. They're looking for delayed performance. And they can't tell when they look at a particular ad whether it's effective or not. So it's, they have a, uh, an informational disadvantage compared to performance advertisers. So what's done, in fact, um, in much of the online world is that uh, there is this uh, a set-aside technique. If you I'll, uh, a typical example, in fact, the example that got me into this in the first place is the Los Angeles Times. Uh, Los Angeles Times, the, the, um, the local Ford dealer comes to the Los Angeles, you know, the, the salesman from the Los Angeles Times goes out to the local Ford dealer and says, um, uh, you know, uh, you bought some ads, and you, know, you need some ads, you bought some ads last year, let's make a deal and we'll put some of your ads in the Los Angeles Times this year. And they negotiate a contract and the salesman says, and while you're at it, by the way, you know, we have a lot of people that visit our website uh, uh, online. You should buy some ads there, too. And uh, so, you know, they uh, buy some ads and they say, you know, I, know, I want a million impressions in this period of time and I want it to be on the auto page and, you know, some general characteristics. And, and that's that. That's how they buy uh, advertising. Well, the problem is that the performance advertisers don't buy advertising like that. You know, the Eric is, is on the web and he, 
he comes to the Los Angeles Times webpage and somebody says, oh boy, you know, there's Eric Maskin, you know, he is, uh, um, he's a high income guy, you know, he's responsive to online advertising, uh, I'm going to, you know, show him an ad for diamond rings or whatever it is. The, the, uh, the, the people who are, performance advertisers are selecting the ads individually. And they're selecting it individually on, for pretty good reasons. Some of the reasons, you know, uh, it, maybe Eric was just at, at, at Amazon or at some other store and was looking at whatever product he was looking for. Uh, you abandoned a, uh, uh, you were going to buy a vacuum cleaner and you abandoned a vacuum cleaner in your, uh, in your shopping cart. And the store where you abandoned your vacuum cleaner would like you to come back. They had some much higher payoff for them of showing an ad for a vacuum cleaner to you right now uh, than a random ad. Okay, because it's just much more likely to result in a sale. So, um, so there, there, there's a matching reason for particular advertisers to want to show something to you, but there's also uh, uh, reasons based on income or, or other things that make you generally valuable that they also get to select on. And the, the local Ford dealer is not looking at that stuff, or not to the same degree. So there's a problem of adverse selection, and there's a problem of, of losing matching value, and there's a question of how you trade those off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to study this problem initially uh, axiomatically. That is, um, I'll tell you, there's basically two ways that you approach auction design in theory. Uh, one approach is, is optimal auctions. You write down a model and you say, what's the best possible auction um, for that problem? I'm going to try to convince you that that's not a suitable approach for this problem. The other problem is axiomatic, which you say, you know, uh, uh, Here's, here's some properties that I would like a good auction to have. What are the auctions that have this property? I'm going to write down those properties and show you there's a unique auction that has this property, and it's a new invention. We filed a patent application for it. Um, the, uh, uh, it's a new auction that's never been seen before, and I'm going to show you the, auction, the unique auction that, solves the, uh, that has the properties that uh, we want, which are not optimality properties, by the way. Um, uh, and I'll talk about a little later about why you might be interested in things that are not optimality properties. And then we're, we're going to take a look. One of my, um, my co-authors has a computer science background and, and uh, uh, wants to know how well the auction does, is likely to do in practice. So we have some benchmarking tests. I never, so this I have to give Nick Arnosti credit for. I mean, it never would have, I never would have dreamed of doing this. We, we actually goes through and does some numerical calculations. And I'll show you that this auction design actually performs really well um, well, you have to see what you think. I mean, the computer scientists will think that these percentages look good. Economists uh, uh, don't have in mind what, what's really well. You know, what's the st what should the standard be? We don't, we don't have a tradition of standards. But I'll show you exactly um, what I mean by really well. What does MSB stand for? That's the name of the auction. It's called Modified Second Bid. And um, I will compare it to um, the set, this idea of setting aside. Um, uh, uh, impressions for the brand advertiser. So here's the, uh, so let me start by showing you the two kinds of display ads. So here's, um, oops, what's going on here? I'm having trouble. Okay, I decided this would be a good one to sit, have for here in Israel. So the, um, so this is a, a, a page from the Miami Herald um, in April of this year. Um, when I was giving a talk, I liked, I, I pulled this ad back for my, for the Israeli audience because of what's on the front page. But um, this is an example of a brand ad. Um, both of these are examples of brand ads. Here's Brickle Heights. Um, what's Brickle Heights? They, there's not even anything to click on. They give you a telephone number that you can call. And there's a big picture. This is a new center that's uh, opened in Miami. There's shopping there. There's apartments that you can buy. You know, what is there? They want you to be aware of it. You know, the, uh, Brickle Heights is with, you know, in big letters, big picture. It's, it's um, trying to create awareness for, uh, for people who are visiting the Miami Herald website. And they have this in their, in their paper uh, uh, too. Over here we have South Motors Oil and Wash. They don't expect you to wash your car by clicking on the site. They expect you to drive your car over there, right, <laughs> uh, to, to get your car washed. And uh, they're telling you it starts from only $24.95. And there's nothing to click on here. This is a brand ad um, that they're trying to, they want you to be aware that uh, there is, you know, that you can go to uh, there and get your car washed for $24.95, which I guess must be a good price there. Okay. Now, the other kind of ad is, you know, lots of things that we see on the internet. 
So here's one that you can't even see you know, what it is, really. It says, uh, open an account today. And it's a savings account. And I can't even tell you as I stand back what the bank is that it's at. But it pays 0.95% interest, uh, which these days is a good interest rate. Um, and, uh, and click and open an account today. This is, a, this is a performance ad. These guys know whether their ad is working because uh, you, know, you either click on the ad or you don't, and they can tell. So, um, so here's the difference. So the, if, if you have a performance ad, and this is, of course, a characterization, right? The, the real world's more complicated than this. But to a first approximation, you know, the goal of a performance uh, display ad is immediate action. You want the guy who's there to click or to fill a form or to buy something. And uh, you decide who to show the ad based on cookies on the website. So Sergio over here was just, you know, at, uh, has been searching for uh, reading articles on re refinancing homes. And the home refinance guy wants to show him an ad because they think maybe he's about to take out a new loan. Um, they're sold one at a time. And the prices for these ads are set by auction, which is to say what happens is the uh, 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 Sergio comes to the website, and in milliseconds, the, the uh, information about him is shot out to, uh, uh, to the ad exchange, which informs the computers of the advertisers who are waiting nearby. And somebody says, that guy, I want to show him a mortgage refinance ad. And, um, uh, and it, I'm willing to pay uh, this much for his impression. An auction takes place. The home refinance guy wins, and that's the ad that appears on the, uh, on the web page. Okay? So uh, Amazon might be engaged in retargeting. So this is uh, you know, somebody, for example, who's abandoned a product in the website, who's been there already. The retargeting ads are particularly valuable. The uh, people who've already been to a website and are looking at a product um, are much more valuable to advertise to than a random person in the category. Uh, Quick and Mortgage, this is a, a you know, refinance site, Hertz Car Rental on the, when, when you're off at, um, if you've just bought a ticket at United Airlines, the next thing you'll see is a Hertz Car Rental ad because you bought an air ticket. Maybe you want to rent a car and you can do it online. Click and do it right now. So that's what the per, this performance display ads look like. Brand display ads are different. The, um, they're sold in the traditional way. This is, this is almost pre-internet stuff. Reach and repetition. I want to show an ad to, you know, Almost everybody in the room, you know what? I'm, I'm Disney. I'm opening a movie next weekend, right? The, I want you all to know that I've got this blockbuster movie opening next weekend. I want buzz. I want everybody to see it, and I want them to see it three times. Right? That's my you know, advertising goal. I might, uh, I might target a particular demographic that's a children's movie. I might uh, buy this en masse. And the price is typically set by contract, which is to say, instead of an, uh, an auction, the uh, Disney buys a contract that with Yahoo, they're going to show a million impressions. Was that a question? You had your hand up, I thought. Oh, OK. So, so and, and these are different advertisers. So I mentioned Disney moving opening. I showed you a shopping center, um, which is just creating awareness. Maybe Ford is having an auto sale this weekend. And, they want, you know, and they're doing a media blitz, television, newspaper, internet. Big sale this weekend at the local Ford dealer. OK, and this is they're trying to create um, awareness. Now, um, here's the problem. John Wanamaker, by the way, is a famous advertising pioneer who was one of the first guys to buy a lot of advertising in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And, and uh, his famous still quoted statement is, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. <laughs> OK. The, um, so um, you know, one of the early advocates of advertising. That's the problem a brand advertiser has. OK. Lots of people went to the Disney movie. Which of the ads caused it? Right? The, um, there was lots of buzz going on. Was it the newspaper, the television, the internet? Who knows? Right? So, the, uh, so, the, so there's a big problem that the brand advertisers have. They don't know what the effectiveness of individual ads is. Now, if Hal Varian were here in the audience, he would object that Google has ways of knowing. Um, <laughs> um, but Hal isn't here, and so I, I will let that go past. OK. Um, so the, here's the problem that we have. On the one hand, the performance advertisers get immediate feedback about the individual ad performance, which could be based on, uh, and they can base their bids on private user cookies. They can know that you abandoned a shopping cart. On the other hand, the brand advertiser has a problem detecting which ads and websites are performing well. 
And uh, mostly it doesn't make use of cookies. It's, uh, uh, it has an information disadvantage in making its bids in an auction. Okay, so that's the, uh, this is the big difference. So there's a, uh, uh, if the brand advertisers and the performance advertisers were competing in an auction together, the brand advertisers would face a form of, the, of, the, of adverse selection that's called the winner's curse. Um, maybe some of you have heard of the winner's curse mentioned before. The winner's curse is the phenomenon that you, know, you tend to win when you're paying too much, when you bid too high, and you tend to, uh, to lose when, you know, when the item is worth uh, more than, uh, than you think. And if you don't really know what something is worth, um, you know, then you, you, there's adverse selection. You get a selection that is uh, not well correlated with the value to you. And, and brand advertisers are particularly, not only are they vulnerable to it because of the information disadvantage, they can't even measure after the fact the, uh, the degree to which they're vulnerable to with it. And that, by the way, is going to be my argument for why optimal auctions is not appropriate here. Um, if you were to try to, to set this up as an optimal auctions problem, you'd say, well, you know, okay, maybe some amount of adverse selection is okay. Maybe at the optimum we need to let, you know, Eric bid for the impressions that are valuable to him, and sometimes they're valuable to him because he's selecting against Ken, but then we'll just charge a Ken a lower price, and, you know, the, at the optimum we'll trade it all off. But, you know, how does Ken know how much adverse selection is going on and whether he's getting a good price? The idea that we have priors and probability distributions is, he knows how much this ad is worth and how much that customer is worth. And the, you know, we're not going to get anybody to agree to this data. And, uh, and they, in particular, the bidders, I have some bidder that says, you know, he's not losing that much. I shouldn't have to pay this extra, much extra for the ad. And Ken says, yes, I am. I'm losing. And there's no data to distinguish it. I mean, it's, we just don't have the kind of data that we need to, to do an optimal auctions analysis. So um, all right, next. Um, so, so what is done in practice? Well, one of the things that's done in practice um, is that uh, when the Ford dealer wants to put up a, or when Disney wants to show an ad, is they, they have what they call a roadblock. They, they say during the period between 5 and 7, you know, uh, uh, Sunday to Thursday this week, my, my movie's opening next weekend, every ad that appears on the front page of Yahoo uh, in, this, in, the, in the banner position is an ad for Disney's opening movie, period. No adverse selection. I'm taking 100% of, uh, of that product. I'm not letting the performance advertisers bid. Even if there's a guy there who they would retarget and who's a lot more valuable to them than to me, I'm taking that guy because I claim, by the way, my, my hypothesis is this is done to prevent adverse selection. I'll, I'll argue that hypothesis a little more. It, Oops, I don't even remember the sentence, so I can't. Uh, um, so, oh, the, so I think I said the advertiser is taking. Uh, so, okay, so let me do it again. Uh, okay, so, so I, I'm not sure which sentence I used the I in, so let me try it again with no pronouns. Um, okay, so, the, uh, uh, so what is done is that uh, Disney. Uh, gets a, uh, all of the ads on the Yahoo front page on the banner between you know, certain hours for certain days. Disney is then not vulnerable to adverse selection because they're getting 100% of the ads in that category. It's not being selected based on information. However, um, uh, Amazon, which wanted to retarget Eric when he was visiting that page and which would have paid a lot for that particular um, uh, for, for that particular impression is being shut out because Disney has uh, blocked uh, uh, that whole category. So, this, uh, so we've avoided adverse selection against Di Disney, but we've lost some of the value that, that, that we could have had by using those slots more effectively. Okay? That's the trade-off. Okay, so, um, so how much could we be losing from this? So this is just a hypothetical example, just to give you a sense. Marketers often use this thing they call the 80-20 rule, uh, in which the idea is that 80% of the value of anything comes from the 20% best user. So let's just use that to, just to get a rule of thumb. So suppose that contracts require that we need 80% of the impressions on the page to be assigned to, on some page to be assigned to brand advertisers, and we're leaving 20% of impressions in some category. I'm talking about a category now for performance advertisers. 
And my notation is going to x is what the value would be at auction if 100% of the impressions had been sold to performance advertisers. That is how much the value of the match would be. And I want to assume, for the purpose of this example, that 80% of the value of performance advertising is associated with the 20% most valuable impressions, the 80-20 rule. Okay? It's a common marketing rule of thumb, which we're going to assume applies to this example. Okay, so uh, here's, the, uh, here's the arithmetic. Suppose 20% of the impressions were randomly chosen for auction, and second price auctions were used for the rest. This is the way I'm going to model set asides is that it's unrelated to anything, it's random. So uh, performance advertisers then get impressions that they value at 0.2x. They get x is what they'd get for all of the impressions. They're getting 20% at random. Performance advertisers are getting 0.2x of the uh, of value. If we ran a second price auction with a reserve, and the reserve were set so that performance advertisers win the 20% of the impressions that are most valuable to them, well, then we're getting the 20% most valuable impressions that has 80% of the value. So uh, compared to the random set aside, uh, second price auctions with reserve uh, extract four times more value from performance ads. You know, that's a big number, right? The, um, this, there's nothing strange about this number. This is the completely plausible, and that's a really big number. So we're losing a lot of value in, uh, in performance matching by using set-asides. Why would you do that? Okay, so the, um, is this example in some way typical? Um, how would the auction gains be shared between the publisher and an advertiser if we were going to run auctions? Can we do anything about it? Can we do better? Okay, so what I'd like to do is to avoid adverse selection and do, and do better. That is, capture a lot of this extra value which is being wasted by uh, the set-aside system. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you now that I, I want to argue that the reason for the set-asides is adverse selection. And the way I'm going to show you that is I'm going to put down a model in which there's no adverse sec selection. And I'm going to show you the different strategy-proof mechanisms that you could use to allocate. And I'm going to show you that in the whole class of, of uh, strategy-proof mechanisms, the absolutely worst one is set-asides. Okay? Uh, there must be adverse selection going on here because this is just absolutely the worst mechanism consistent with incentives that, uh, that allocates. Well, you'll see. So here it is. More generally, suppose that there's one brand advertiser and n performance advertisers. Simple basic model. Suppose that the match values are independently and identically distributed from some distribution f with some density little f, and that this is the Meyerson virtual value function. Uh, That's for the performance, what's that? That's for the performance. Advertiser. For the perform uh, yes, for the performance advertisers are these, right? And for the end performance advertisers. And, and for the brand, what's, uh, do you care about the brand? Uh, no, the, uh, what, I'm, I'm not. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to care about the brand advertiser. You'll see why, but no. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to imagine that there's a contract and that we have fixed the proportion of impressions to be awarded to the brand advertiser. Now, if the brand advertiser... Uh, if the brand advertiser's values were statistically independent of the uh, performance advertiser's values, if there weren't a problem of adverse selection, um, then picking, then this would be fine. There's no adverse selection would be created by this. So just suppose for the moment that there weren't any adverse selection, the brand advertiser's values have any distribution at all, statistically independent, and we have some proportion of impressions that by contract we have to assign to the brand advertiser. Theorem. Among all symmetric strategy proof auctions for which the performance advertisers win with probability 1 minus lambda and the brand advertisers with probability lambda, the random set aside mechanism minimizes the total expected value of the performance impressions, minimizes the expected seller revenue if the virtual value function is non decreasing, and minimizes the bidder's expected surplus if this function is uh, non decreasing. Okay? It is the worst thing that you can do, um, uh, the worst thing you could possibly do by these welfare criterions for this class of distributions. Okay, um, so this is uh, part, of, part of the argument I'm making that, okay, and here's the proof. The proof is, e is easy, it's three steps. Okay, um, standard characterizations, the seller's expected revenue is the uh, expected probability that the item is assigned to the highest performance bidder 
times the virtual value of the highest performance bidder. Okay? That's one standard characterization that comes out of Meyerson. The bidder's expected profits is the expected probability that the item is assigned to the, uh, uh, to the highest performance bidder, that's the first order statistic, times this um, uh, inverse hazard rate evaluated at the highest order statistic. These are standard formulas in auction theory. Okay? Second step, uh, strategy proof mechanisms imply, uh, strategy proofness implies that P has to be non-decreasing. If you, uh, if by bidding more, if by bidding less you could increase your probability of winning, you would, right? The, uh, uh, a necessary condition for strategy proofness is that P is non-decreasing. And then it's just majorization. The expected value of, an, of the product of two non-decreasing functions is greater than or equal to the product of the expected values. And the, um, Let's see, is that it? The, uh, the product of the, the, uh, the expected value of the probability that the highest performance advertiser wins is 1 minus lambda. So what we're getting is 1 minus lambda times, so what we're getting is 1 minus lambda times the value, 1 minus lambda times the revenue, 1 minus lambda times the, uh, we're, uh, 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 times the profits for the three guys, and that's less than the expected value of the product for any strategy proof mechanism. So this is absolutely the worst mechanism in the set of symmetric strategy proof mechanisms. Okay? So why, why do people use set-asides? So my diagnosis is that this is adverse selection. Adverse selection is a serious enough problem to explain the use of set-asides uh, in, in preference to auctions in this uh, context. Right? Well, Informally, uh, set-asides, of course, there are other reasons. Set-asides are familiar to brand advertisers from other media. If you were a uh, Ford and you're buying an ad, you're accustomed to saying, you know, on that television show, um, you know, I'm buying that ad. Everybody who watches that show is going to see it. So there's, there's probably some stasis that's involved, too, that the, uh, uh, you know, th this is something customary. That's the way you bought ads, so we continue to buy ads that way. Um, and without set-asides, uh, brand advertisers would have to bid into auctions, which is an unfamiliar activity, so there might be some resistance to it, but just based on public information about impressions. These days, however, you know, the idea of bidding for ads on internet, that's pretty well known, and the, the advertisers are mostly using ad agencies anyway, which have lots of experience bidding into auctions. It hardly seems likely that this is the explanation. Um, performance advertisers can use more detailed information, in, including cookies, to select impressions and whatever the losses are uh, due to adverse selection, I hypothesize, are, are large enough to justify resistance to auctions and, and much higher prices for set-aside impressions. Actually, the other fact that I haven't told you is that the uh, prices that the brand advertisers pay for these impressions are much higher than average auction prices, and they do it anyway. Okay? In fact, I remember being advise, asking at Yahoo at some point when I was advising there, and they were afraid. They don't understand why are their brand advertisers paying so much more than they would have to pay at auction, and they're just sort of pinching themselves. But they are, so let's do it. And I claim that could be explained by adverse selection. In principle, the brand advertisers like to, so for example, if I'm Coke and I said, I'm releasing cherry Coke today, so I need the front page of Yahoo, but if someone has a cookie from the Diabetic Association website, I don't want to show them cherry Coke, I want to show them you know, no sugar cherry Coke. So in principle, they must want So it could be that the more important thing is the inability to track, perhaps. The, um, yeah, it could be that, again, this is unfamiliar, but I, I agree with you. That could be it. Um, in any case, the, the, uh, the big question that this talk is about is, if this is the problem, what can we do about it? Okay? Now, this sounds like a thorny problem. That's why I'm giving you a research talk about it, right? This sounds like a thorny problem. We, on the one hand, we really want to allow the matching to take place where it's possible. On the other hand, if you, let, if you pick uh, um, impressions based on the bids, there's a problem of adverse selection. So how do you deal with those two? Um, yeah, go ahead. Just to follow up on Rachel's question, it seems to me like there's a little bit of a tension between your first, second, and third points. In particular, you were saying, you were saying that unfamiliarity with auctions does not explain what's going on, but that unfamiliarity with using cookies mm -hmm. is part of it. And it seems like you know both of those things are actually sort of so why should we believe that people should easily be able to get familiar with auctions but not easily be able to get familiar with using cookies in an optimal 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't have a, a sharp uh, retort to that question. I think the, the, it, it could be that the, the inability to check, the Wanamaker quote is the, is the more important one, possibly. Um, you know, I think the, the, my experience in the real world is a complicated place, and all of these effects are going on to some degree. But it may be that the big one really is the uh, inability to know whether you're, whether you're subject to adverse selection and, and uh, you're sure if the items are being set aside. Okay, so, so the question that, that uh, this was a consulting question, is it possible to capture most of the matching value and also avoid adverse selection? And it's easy to write down models in which the answer to that is no. I mean, if, if the value to the brand advertiser is perfectly correlated to the value with the value to performance advertisers, then any time the performance advertiser selects something, that's something the brand advertiser would have wanted. You can't avoid adverse selection and, and, and get matching. So it's easy to write down models in which the answer is no. So it has to be that we're going to need some assumptions uh, for the answer to be yes. So we're going to do that. But here's the idea that we're going to try to capture in the formal model. The idea is that, that, is that there's a different signature uh, for impressions that have high consumer value and impressions that have high match value. That impressions with high consumer quality uh, can be distinguished from those with idi idiosyncratic uh, match quality based on this characteristic. If, the, uh, if, if there's high consumer quality, all the bids will tend to be high. And if there's high uh, match quality, one bid will tend to be high. Okay? And those are different signatures. And the, the auction design that I am going to uh, suggest is going to exploit that signature. It's going to say, you know, um, so I'm going to imagine something like the 80-20 law, something like a power law distribution. Every once in a while, most of the value of, of matching comes from these occasional very good matches. And you can figure those out from the pattern of bids because there's one bid that's way higher than all the others. And uh, you'll be able to exploit that in the auction design. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Okay, so, um, so, and I'm going to do this axiomatically because, uh, so axiomatically means I'm going to look, I'm going for zero adverse selection, which I've already told you is not an optimality property. There's a long tradition of this. If you were in statistics, for example, I remember reading a wonderful example of Tom Ferguson's about this. The, the, um, um, in statistics, you know, we often look for things like, let's say, minimum variance unbiased estimators. Okay, why unbiased? Unbiasedness is not an optimality property. Um, the, uh, you know, if you have a loss function that's square error, why not just minimum square error? And there's this wonderful example that I remember from, uh, you're nodding like maybe you know this example, where the, the, uh, Tom Ferguson has an example in an old textbook where he shows that, um, suppose that you're trying to estimate the probability that the next item that you draw from some sample is red, something like that, and you, you have some history of the number of items that have been drawn. It turns out there's a unique unbiased estimator that depends on the sufficient statistic. And it's minus 1 to the n. Um, so that you estimate the probability is minus 1 to the power of the number of times some event has happened. It's the only unbiased estimator. And it, um, it gives you an estimate of either minus 1 or 1 for a probability, which is, you know. So the Ferguson says, obviously, unbiasedness is not an optimality property. And when you look for minimum variance unbiased estimators, you're not necessarily finding something very good. So here I am going to look for adverse selection free mechanisms. That's not an optimality property. So what we're going to do later on is we're going to do some computations and see how well we do. But we're going to impose the um, uh, adverse selection freeness as the, as the goal of the exercise. OK. Um, so we're going to have a bunch of standard mechanism properties. We're going to have a private values assumption initially. Uh, each bidder n, uh, that each performance bidder knows its own value for the impression. Um, an auction, a display auction is called weakly efficient. For every bid profile, the impression is awarded either to the brand advertiser or to the highest performance advertiser. Lemma, in the private values model, a weakly efficient deterministic mechanism is strategy proof if and only if it's a threshold auction. It's the same kind of theorem that I mentioned to you before. What you have to do is you have to figure out a price based on the other bids. And the, uh, if the highest bid is higher than that price, uh, you award the item to the highest bidder for that price. And otherwise, you don't. Um, and if, if nobody exceeds their threshold price, you award it to the brand advertiser. Okay. Threshold auction sets a price for each bidder as a function of the other bids. Okay, this is familiar and similar to what we've seen before. 
So um, we're going to imagine an auction for one single impression, and B is going to be the, um, the brand advertiser's value. Okay, so uh, XN is going to be the, the value of performance advertiser N, and C, which I'm going to call the consumer quality, is the expected value is, is consumer quality based on everything that the, uh, that the performance advertisers know. It's the conditional expected value of B given all the information that the uh, uh, performance advertisers have. And I'm going to normalize it, divide it by the expected value of V. So this is a number that, uh, a random variable that has mean 1. And um, it basically says, um, you know, uh, how good is the consumer? Okay? Um, relative to the average value of a consumer to the, perform to the brand advertiser. And I'm going to take this, this vector x and divide it by this number c. These are a random vector, a random number. The ratio is a random vector. Uh, that's the, well, I'll call that the match quality vector. So m1 is uh, rel how much relatively more valuable this impression is to uh, performance bidder 1, m2 to performance bidder 2, and so on. Okay? So I'm going to imagine that there's a match quality and a consumer quality. And what's going on in this world is there's adverse selection because sometimes these bidders bid high because the consumer quality is high. And sometimes they bid high because the match quality is high. And the, the, the auctioneer can't tell the difference. OK, given a, a bid profile x for the performance bidders, let zn of x be the probability that the mechanism awards the impression to performance advertiser n. And z0 of x, the probability that a mechanism awards it to the performance advertiser. A mechanism is, is adverse selection free. So this is, uh, this is what we're going for. A mechanism is adverse selection free if for every, it's really separate, distributions of m and c, uh, such that m and c are independent. In other words, for every joint distribution of match values and for every distribution um, uh, of the uh, consumer quality c, the, uh, the probability that I assign the item to the brand advertiser as a function of the bids is statistically independent of the consumer quality. Okay? Adverse selection free. There is absolutely no dependence from the uh, brand advertiser's point of view between, it, it, as far as he's concerned, he's getting a random selection of the impressions. Sergio, you look puzzled. Is there something wrong with the definition? No, 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 no. no. I'm just trying to figure out. M, M was defined, uh, what was M? M was defined using C, right? So to get independence between them is not so easy. Not so easy. Out when you get it. Okay, good. I'm glad you don't know. Okay, the, uh, <laughs> Sergio doesn't know the answer. I want everybody to record this here. The, um, okay, so uh, maybe I should go slowly now. Um, OK, so, so a mechanism is adverse selection free if, uh, if we have statistical independence between um, uh, x and c, given that m and c are independent. Theorem, OK, so I didn't wait very long. Uh, a threshold auction is adverse selection free if and only if the pricing function is homogeneous of degree 1. OK, the, um, really simple. OK, the, the basically, uh, so this is the threshold price that we use. And uh, if all of the impressions are multiplied by some constant, then the threshold price is multiplied by the same constant. Okay? So what's going to happen is that the assignment now is, uh, so let's see, what have I got here? The, the brand advertiser wins exactly when the, um, uh, uh, Oh, here I've got this done just for the second price. OK. OK, I didn't do these slides too well. Um, so this is for the, OK, I'm, I'm going to tell you, but the proof that's here is for the modified second bid auction. I didn't do the general proof for you. So uh, I will tell you what I'm going to prove uh, in a moment. So the, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a pricing function that depends only on the two highest bids to begin with. Um, so how do I set the price? Uh, given the two highest bids. So what, what functions are homogeneous of degree 1 uh, for the two highest bids? It's, uh, it's something that, it, here's what it is. Basically, the, uh, you sell the item to the highest performance bidder, or the, the uh, highest performer bidder wins exactly when his value is at least alpha times the second highest performance bid. If, you only depend on, if it only depends on two bids, those are the only homogeneous of degree uh, 1 functions, the only homogeneous of degree 0 assignment rule okay? um, for, for some constant alpha. 
And this, is, this holds if and only if c times m1 is bigger than alpha c times m2, since x1 is equal to c times m1. And that holds if and only if m1 is less than or equal to alpha times m2. And if the match values and the consumer quality are independent, then uh, this event is independent of c. OK, so, so the idea is, you know, we just take a look. And I've, I've just shown you this for one particular. The, this proof generalizes to, um, uh, I'm sorry I didn't put down the general proof. This proof generalizes to general homogeneous of degree uh, one functions for pricing if the, uh, if the price can depend on all of the bids. This is, uh, uh, this is the mechanism I'm going to end up looking at, though, and I, uh, that's the proof I ended up sticking in here. Converse is routine. The, if, if the function is not homogeneous of degree one, it's easy to construct distributions. Remember, it has to hold for all distributions. It's easy to construct distributions for which you don't get independence. OK. A mechanism is false name proof if no winning bidder can reduce its price by placing additional bids, and no seller can increase its price by, uh, by placing additional very low bids. I don't want it to be possible for a seller to manipulate the price by you know, sticking in some bids that are low and have virtually zero chance of winning. And uh, this is a standard definition, um, the first part, that uh, a bidder shouldn't be able to reduce its price by placing additional bids. A threshold auction is a modified second bid auction if there exists a number alpha bigger than 1, such that the, the price that, uh, that we uh, quote for any bidder is alpha times the maximum of the bids among the other bidders. Yeah. Right. Yes. OK. And then a theorem, a, thre a threshold auction is, a d is deterministic, adverse selection free, and false name proof if and only if it's a modified second bid auction. So, the, um, so what this axiomatic uh, approach tells us is that there's exactly one solution to this problem. Again, it's not an, an optimal auctions problem. It's, uh, it's an axiomatic characterization. If we say nobody's going to be able to agree about probability distributions, but we want the thing to be adverse selection free, and we want it to be false name proof, then it's a modified second bid auction. That is, it awards the item to the highest bidder if and only if the highest bidder's bid is at least alpha times the second highest bid. OK? Oh yeah. So the other, if if I don't put in deterministic, you can also um, you can also mix in some set asides and some probability mixtures among them. There's not. Uh, yeah, I haven't talked about it. It's not very interesting, but the um, that's right. Okay. Yeah. X is not independent of C. M is independent of C. X, X is equal to C times M. And um, so this event is independent of C. And this is the same as the event that the highest bid is less than or equal to alpha times the second highest bid. So in, in other words, the, this criterion that the highest bid is independent, uh, 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 is less than alpha times the second highest bid is identical to the criterion that the highest match value is less than alpha times the second highest match value. And I want to assign on match value. I don't want to assign based on the uh, consumer quality. Well, I, I'm still coming back to my question. I mean, I mean since clearly it's, this property does not hold if M and C are not independent, yep. then it means that to understand this axiom, we must understand when we get M and C being independent right. and why it makes sense there and not otherwise. Right? Why? What, ma what makes sense because there? That axiom clearly, so you may say it's a weak axiom because it only holds when M and C happen to, to come up independent. But, but to understand the logic of that axiom. Uh, oh, this is not an axiom. This is a definition. The, um, this is a definition. This isn't an axiom. This is a, it's a I'm requirement. Saying, it's a requirement of, no, the requirement of adverse, adverse selection free. Mm -hmm. you, yes. I, I use the word axiom because you use it. Okay, no axiom. So that um, requirement, to understand why that yeah. requirement makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand when is it if you get MNC independent, what does it mean? And why mm -hmm. that makes sense then and not otherwise? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I do intend to come back to that. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, in the definition, it's here because we know that we can't hope 
to have the, that the only thing that's going to be, what I'm trying to do is to see whether I can recapture some of this enormous lost match value. Um, and we know that the answer is no if they're perfectly correlated. I've just, I just argued for you that, of course, if it's always the case that the performance advertiser and the brand advertisers value the same impressions, that if the, th then there's no, no, nothing to do about the problem. On the other hand, we also know from the data that that's not the way the data looks. The way the data looks is a lot of the time we have one very large bid that's way bigger than the others. That's really common in the real data. So the, uh, and that suggests you know, that we can do something like this. So now what, I, now what I'm looking at is a theoretical model that says, you know, when does it work perfectly? And then we're going to talk about when it works imperfectly. But this is a, uh, so this is a condition that says, under these circumstances, it could be possible to actually, um, uh, you know, when we have actual independence between M and C, then we can get actual adverse selection freeness. And when we don't, so, and, 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 and this is the only auction that does that, and then we can ask how this auction performs in other circumstances. So that's the, that's the logical approach that I'm taking. Okay, let me um, push forward here. So this is the big axiomatic theorem. This is, um, it's axiomatic, and, and as, as uh, Sergio correctly points out, the, uh, why should you be interested in adverse selection free? I think this is the way I want to rephrase Sergio's question. You're only interested in adverse selection free if you think that there's something to the uh, independence between the, the uh, match values and the consumer quality being separate independent variables. And part of the idea is that the, uh, you know, Eric may be a guy who is, um, you know, uh, general, he's a high income guy, that's a permanent characteristic, but, the, uh, but he also has a temporary characteristic that today he abandoned an item at the uh, Amazon store. There's a, a lot of fluctuation in the dimension that's completely independent of his consumer quality. Match quality uh, typically depends on temporary characteristics. Consumer quality typically depends on permanent characteristics. That's why I expect that there's some hope that something like this could be reasonable. All right. Um, okay, and I think it's the mechanism is false name proof because it depends only on the two highest bids, and there's an assumption in the model that n is at least two. And any mechanism that depends on more bids can't be false name proof because uh, when n if it depends on the top three bids and n happens to be two. Um, then the guy, by putting in a third bid, either the buyer or seller can manipulate. The me uh, mechanism is adverse selection free if and only if uh, P is homogeneous of degree one. And the only functions that are homogeneous of, d of degree one um, with the, uh, that are a function of two arguments are the functions I, is the function I just showed you. Okay. So the last piece of this, so that's how we get to this design. And the last piece of this is to ask how it performs. Okay, and um, again, I, uh, uh, what I want to do is I want to compare the modified second bid auction to two other standards. The one I want to compare it to is set-asides. How much better does it do than just randomly setting something aside? You know, we're not going to get, uh, unless we actually have independence between M and C, we're not going to get perfect adverse selection freeness. But how much, are, how, much are we, how much value do we hope to capture by this? Maybe it's enough to make us uh, interested. And I also want to compare it to what the uh, computer science guys call opt, which is um, suppose that uh, you, you got to optimize and you didn't have the adverse selection freeness constraint. You just look for the thing that you know, gives a uh, fraction lambda of impressions to the brand advertiser and you just get the biggest value you can for the performance advertisers. How, much, how, much, how do we compare, do compare to that? So that's not feasible. That kills the... Uh, 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 the brand advertiser, but suppose we don't care about the brand advertiser. How, what fraction of opt can I get uh, out of this mechanism? And the, I, the intuition is going to be that if most of the value, if we have a power law distribution or any fat tailed distribution where most of the value comes from these extreme um, distributions, it's not, we're going to do really well. We're going to capture, this is the things we're going to capture. The, you know, one bid is really high compared to all the other bids. Yep, we recognize that. We pull that one aside. And if that's where most of the value comes, we're going to get really good performance. So let's see how it goes. So the notation is that MK is the kth order statistic of the match values. R is the ratio of the highest to the second highest match value. And uh, for the benchmark computations, I'm going to assume that these random variables MN are IID draws from a power law distribution with parameter A. 
So that means that the probability that the match value is bigger than some number mu is mu to the minus a. OK, this is a fat-tailed distribution that is uh, um, commonly used. So for those of you who haven't seen the power law distribution before or haven't studied it, let me make it a little intuitive to you. Uh, a, a variable mn has a power law distribution if and only if its logarithm has an exponential distribution. Okay? I think everybody here probably knows the properties of exponential distributions, so let's see how those are reflected in the power law. Uh, the first thing in, in an exponential distribution, for example, if you have you know, people arriving at a queue and you ask uh, what's the difference between the, um, uh, it, it, you take a look at the next to last arrival and the last arrival and you ask what's the distribution of the difference between the, the last arrival and the next to last arrival, it's also exponential with the same distribution, right? Because conditional on waiting some amount of time, the remaining waiting time is just the same. And, it's, and that distribution, the difference between the highest and second highest waiting time, is independent of the, high, of the second highest waiting time. So the same property is inherited here. The ratio of the highest to the second highest value is statistically independent of the second highest value. It's the same statement as the waiting time statement for exponential distributions. Second, uh, just like the difference between the last and second last arrival time has an exponential distribution, so the ratio between the two highest match values has a power law distribution. And third of all, just as the uh, expected waiting time, um, uh, total waiting time, the, for suppose that the second last guy arrives at time 15, and I ask when I expect the last guy to arrive, it's 15 plus the mean uh, of the exponential distribution. Similarly, the, uh, the expected value of r, given r is bigger than alpha, is alpha times the expected value of r. It's, again, the same statement um, about, uh, about means. Okay? So these are properties of the, of the power law distribution that are inherited from the exponential distribution. Yeah? So I could easily control. <laughs> I could easily. I couldn't easily control. Somebody could easily control. So the the um, the I I do have some data. The data I have is really dirty, and uh, I've chosen not to um, I've chosen not to base any statistical test. The the clean data that I have comes from an experiment, and it's completely confidential. Um, so I can't. I don't have anything I can report to you. I can report to you. It's common knowledge among people who do this that the, 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 extreme, the, the occasional extreme values, that's common knowledge among people who do this. I'm going to leave it there. OK, so um, the comparison to set aside. So the fat tail assumption is the match values are IID. So from a power law distribution, or, or in fact any distribution in which this thing is not increasing, this thing is a constant for the power law distribution. Fat tails means um, this. OK? Um, for the power law, uh, this function is the constant that's in the parameter of the power law. OK? Theorem, if you take a look at a modified second bid auction with a parameter alpha bigger than 1, so the ratio has to be at least alpha, and if the distributions uh, satisfy the fat tail assumption, then the bidder profits and the seller revenues are at least alpha times higher than in the random set-aside mechanism. OK? Um, so there's a Pareto gain from this mechanism. Both the bidders and the seller um, benefit, and they benefit by a factor of at least alpha, where alpha is the ratio uh, that you require between the highest and the second highest bids. So let's see. The, the, if doing the power law case, the computations are easy, so let's take a look at how it works. Let's take a look. Let me show you how you get the expected uh, value from performance impressions. So EVP is the expected value, total value, from performance impressions. So it's the match value. Um, it, it, it's the value to the winning advertiser, which is x1, which is c times m1, uh, times the indicator that this ratio is bigger than alpha. So this is the expected value for, uh, that you get from the um, uh, uh, from total value you get out of the assignment. And uh, c is independent of m, and it has mean 1, so I'm just dropping it from the expressions. Uh, that's now, 
Uh, M1 is R times M2, so I can replace M1 as, with R times M2 over here and drop C. Okay? Um, M2 is independent of R, so I can take this R ind indicator R greater than alpha and this M2 and separate them. And that gives me the expected value of M2 times the expected value of R given R bigger than alpha times the probability that R is bigger than alpha. Well, the probability that R is bigger than alpha is uh, alpha is chosen so that that's 1 minus lambda. So the probability that R is bigger than alpha is 1 minus lambda. And the expected value of R given R is bigger than alpha is alpha times the expected value of R. And this term is the expected value of M2. So this is just alpha times 1, uh, one minus lambda. And then you can recombine these terms and uh, get the expected value of M1. Recombine them the same way you took them apart up above. So uh, this says that the expected total value in the auction is alpha times what you would get from random set-asides. With random set-asides, you'd pick a 1 minus alpha fraction at random, and you'd get the uh, average value. Okay? And you can do the same thing for the expected revenues, and you can do the same thing, oops, and you can do the same thing for the expected bid or profits. You get alpha times what you would have gotten uh, from the random set-asides. You get alpha times what you would have gotten from performance impressions for the power law, for the case of the power law distribution. And you get at least alpha for the case of fat value, uh, fat tail distributions in general. I'm sorry, the, you're right. I, Pareto is the wrong, uh, wrong word. Well, for the brand advertiser, so it's not just the brand advertiser, the brand advertiser in an adverse selection free mechanism gets the same payoff. The, this is adverse selection free, so we haven't affected the brand advertiser's payoff. Okay, so how big could this be? So let's go back to the 80-20 rule and suppose we're looking at the expected value of R times R is in its top quintile. Okay, we know that the 80-20 uh, the rule says that's 0.8 times the expected value of R. It corresponds to a power law distribution with A equal 1.16. Um, so if you use A equal 1.16 and you res if, if you happen to reserve 80% of the ads for brand, I picked that number so that you can do these computations in your head. Um, if you, that lambda equals 0.8. Um, so you infer that the performance revenues and profits must be increasing by 300% from the calculation I did before. That means alpha is 4. So we're getting a... If 80%, if we have the power law case with the 80-20 rule and we're setting aside 80% of the uh, ads for performance advertisers and, and I'm sorry, for, for brand advertisers, um, we, the, on, the, on the ads that we're selling to performance advertisers, this claims a factor of four improvement, both in the revenues on average and in the profits that are earned by the performance advertisers and zero effect on the brand advertiser. So it's this pretty. Is, this assumes a monopoly seller. No, no monopoly seller. You have competing providers of advertising. Right? We do. All right. So, so, um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the economics of this industry. Let me tell you a little more about the economics of this industry. So. Um, uh, uh, so let, let's not talk about the brand advertiser. It, it, Los Angeles Times has sold the ad to the brand. We're talking about the bidders who are coming to this auction. I think that's who you're asking about. And for the bidders who are coming to the auction, it turns out that um, uh, you can make an argument anyway that there, that, the, uh, that there are no diminishing returns to scale. That is, the, the, uh, what, what I want when, when I am, um, if I've got an online store, um, and I get twice as many clicks and twice as many sales. I deliver twice as many products and I make twice the profits. The, the um, oh. okay. But these, but these uh, the providers of space, I don't know what you call them. Yeah, the impressions, yeah, the, the publishers. Publishers. The, 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 they're dividing up. They're not, they're, they're no, they're, they're, they're not, actually. So this is one of the interesting things. For brand ads, they are. When Coca-Cola is advertising, it has some fixed number of, of times it wants you to see the ad every week. But the, uh, a brand advertiser who is you know, uh, selling mortgage refinancing normally has extra capacity. And if they can get more, more, more customers, they want it. Or there's, if you have an online store and you're selling books, you get more people buying books, 
you're happy to take them. No, no, but if, it's, if, they're, if Amazon really had a competitor, <laughs> no, this is this is this is not Amazon. This is the publisher that you're. It's Yahoo. Yeah, all right. And yeah, there, there are other places that people can go, and the bidders bid in both of those places. They want all the customers, right? They, the, uh, at the margin, their well, values the are. The number of clicks is going to be half, but if somebody else makes like the, uh, the, the. If I subscribe to uh, whatever Yahoo's competitor is, yeah. then I don't subscribe to Yahoo. So the number of clicks that Yahoo has Yahoo to. Has to is now half what it was. Sure, but but that's not being determined in the auction. What I'm, what's going on? What's not determined. What's happening? You're now talking about whether you go to Yahoo or whether you go to you know some other the the Los Angeles Times for your news. But the prices. And those prices are not being charged to you. They're being charged to the advertiser who's advertising to you. I understand, but the advertiser is getting half the number of clicks. If what? If if, if I bid bid for Yahoo yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another. Yeah. Then uh, I'm getting only half. The, um, the value is half as much. Ken, Ken, you're confused. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to straighten you out here, but you're confused. You you keep mixing on who's on which side of the market. Okay. The um, so um, uh, all right. So if if I have Yahoo and I uh, you can go to for news to various news websites. Let's say we're talking about the Los Angeles Times, which is sort of the Miami Herald, which is where this started, and you can go to other news websites. The way I run this auction has nothing to do Who, with you? I, the, the way the exchange or the way, let's say, the, the Los Angeles Times runs the, its auction for advertising does not affect how, whether you are going to Yahoo or the Los Angeles Times for your news. So that's, that's a, exogenous to this model. You are there, you're an impression, the impression is being sold, and, the, uh, and the, the, it's the advertisers who are competing for the impression. You're there, you're at Yahoo, or you're at the Los Angeles Times. Yeah, well, what is the advertiser buying? The advertiser's buying an impression. That's right. I mean, the value of the impression depends on the number of people who are going to click it. And that's exogenous yeah, in this but model. Half, but they know uh, if people are not, uh, yes. half the people have moved from Yahoo. The, all of that's true, but it's irrelevant. The point is that that's exogenous they, here. The, it's, the problem is, Yes, so that's fine. Excess. All that's all correct. The, the, the excess are exactly each other distribution. How many people are going to click? Yeah. The B, which is the value of that, that's exactly what uh, that's a data. How many people? It doesn't matter, but that's given to you. There's that's some distribution of how many people are going to click. Could be that the people of other times, it's very different than from Yahoo. 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 It's Yahoo. different distribution of excess or value. Oh. And it's not affected by any of this. But now you have a distribution. So we're talking about an impression that's there at Yahoo or, or the Los Angeles Times, and I've, I've treated it as exogenous because it's not affected by any of this. Right? Okay, so anyway, this is, um, uh, there's an enormous increase in, in uh, uh, value. A second example is when 50% of the ads are reserved, and if you go through the calculations again, You'll find then that there's an 80% increase in the, uh, of the alpha is 1.8. You get an 80% increase in the profits, both, of, both in the profits of the uh, performance advertisers and in the revenue of, the, so you're just doing better matching. This is a matching problem. We're, we're trying to do matching without adverse selection. And we're saying, let's suppose we use this trick to kill adverse selection. Would you, the trick that I described, you take a look at the profile of bids, and if all the bids are high, say that, you know, Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ken doesn't believe me. All right. Um, oh, I'm in trouble here, Ken. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, you know, we'll we'll have a few minutes. We'll have a few minutes. We'll come back to it. Let me finish the main the main line. 
Go ahead, Eric. So, so, suppose, suppose that by running this mm -hmm. uh, this ad, mm -hmm. excuse me, this ad auction, mm -hmm. the LA Times uh, can generate much more ad revenue. That then it may be able to outperform. The oh, sure. Side. So this is a partial equilibrium analysis. In that if you wanted a general equilibrium, if you if you're making a general equilibrium point that once the uh, that you know, once this company does better, the the uh, they they show different uh, they you know they show different articles and they hire better newspaper reporters and attract more customers. That's not in this model. That's right. If that's the point you intend, I will grant you that. This is uh, um, uh, this is just the auction, and the L.A. Times doesn't really expect well okay <laughs> doesn't really expect that general equilibrium effect. But uh, but it's not in here. I grant you. Okay. Now I want a comparison to the uh, second price auction with reserve, which uh, we're calling SPR in sort of uh, computer science-y uh, methods. So consider a second price auction, which the reserve price is set so that the auction delivers the same fraction of impressions lambda to the brand advertiser as the modified second bid does with uh, alpha. So I'm matching alpha and, uh, uh, and lambda so that, you know, alpha, so that I'm delivering the right fraction of impressions. I'm matching the reserve price. Theorem, set C equal to 1. It doesn't matter. Uh, here, I, I imagine that you know, c setting C equal to 1 almost surely means that I don't have to worry about adverse selection. It means that the, uh, I'm giving the best possible treatment to the second price auction because it's not causing any adverse selection because there's no variation in consumer quality. Okay? So if there's no variation in consumer quality and there's no adverse selection in, in the second price auction, then for all power law distributions, all fixed numbers of bidders n and all alpha, the ratio of seller revenues and performance bidder profits under the modified second bid to those in the optimal second bid auction with the reserve is no less than 0.886. Um, so uh, this, which comes from a gamma function calculation. In, anyway, the uh, but you 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 can solve the minimization problem and uh, and find the performance. So this is saying that if if there weren't any problem with adverse selection we still get the lion's share of the value out of this auction uh, that we would have gotten from, a, uh, from an optimal auction, which is a second bid auction with reserve. Okay? Um, and I think that's pretty much what I got. The, uh, so why don't I talk to Ken for a minute here? Um, so I told you this was going to be a shorter presentation. But uh, Ken, let's circle back here. Was that what you were talking about, the general equilibrium effect? The feedback the, the, to the, the feedback among, yeah. So you know, so. Right, you know, I'm thinking over. It might be uh, the opposite. We <laughs> pay two of them to merge. I haven't looked at the industrial organization no, of the no, market. I'm not talking about the, all these extra things like mm -hmm. better reporters. I mean, just the two of them reserved to selling twice the. Um, uh, no, they're selling the same number. It's just whether they sell it. You know, with the, you, you. The number of, of impressions that are available for sale is determined by the consumer browsing around. And, and the consumer can browse to the New York Times website or the LA Times website or the Yahoo News site and, uh, um, to get his news. And that's oh, I see. You're saying there's not a, you're not dividing the market. There's the same person, the consumer, the ultimate consumer, can search simultaneously through all the websites. No, I wasn't doing simultaneously. No, I'm dividing them. You can go to one website yeah, yeah, yeah. or the other. I mean, but I was assuming that someone goes to the Los Angeles Times website, he doesn't go. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming, too. I'm oh, assuming, right. okay, I'm assuming that. The two would, would, would double the value to the To whom? No, the, the, adverti the advertiser goes to both websites. The, the advertiser gets, you, right. you, go, you go to the Los Angeles Times, Sergio goes to, to the LA Times. The advertiser gets to, to, to sell to, uh, to buy ads and show ads to both of you. And if the two merge, he gets to do exactly the same thing. There's no value created by merging, uh, no extra clicks created by merging the two sites. Which cost function? There are, essentially, there are no costs for running this website. Oh, you're going to talk about cost of running the website separately. OK. That has nothing to do with the auction. The cost of running, if there are economies of scale in running the websites, then there are economies of scale in running the websites. That has nothing to do with the, uh, the analysis of auction rules. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to summarize and bring this, and then we can 
argue about it more if you like. The, 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 sum, the summary here is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this back to the top very quickly. So what have we done? I should have put this at the end. So what we've done is, first of all, I've told you that there's two kinds of display ads, that, the, uh, that there's a problem of adverse selection against brand advertisers. Uh, I guess you guys have convinced me that the main reason for that is they, they don't know what's happening. with uh, uh, They can't measure, as Weinemacher says, which half of their ad money is doing something and which isn't. The performance advertisers can, and they can select the good ads. That contractual set-asides uh, are widely used, uh, uh, and they have the effect of, of ensuring the bidders against adverse selection. They also have the effect of a blocking efficient matching. Um, and in fact, as I showed you, the contractual set-asides among all incentive-compatible mechanisms for allocating the ads, they're pessimal. They minimize the total uh, welfare. They minimize the seller uh, uh, revenues. They minimize the bidder profits. They're just, uh, in, in a model without adverse selection, they're a terrible idea. And, and, and uh, that's why I, uh, I think that it's reasonable to suppose that the reason for them is that there is adverse selection. Then I showed you that if, and this is the if that, that Sergio wants to emphasize. Actually, I, I ended up not doing any of the sensitivity analysis description that I would have done. I got distracted here. Um, there's a bunch of other assumptions, too. But uh, the, for, for, the first, um, for the first result, if we can separate the consumer quality from the match quality, uh, then we can perfectly cancel the adverse selection and capture the lion's share of the match value. And the benchmarking test tells us that we do way, way better than set-asides in this respect. And we come actually to within a, a, you know, a decent, we get a decent fraction of the actual optimum as if there were no um, uh, adverse selection problems. So the, the, uh, we're not paying very much to eliminate the uh, adverse selection problem. Now, what Sergio wants to emphasize is I haven't said that we did eliminate the adverse selection problem. And I, I acknowledge that to begin with, this independence of the, uh, of the consumer value and the match value um, is what's needed for the adverse selection problem to be completely eliminated. And I've tried to give you an idea of why that's not completely crazy, that the consumer quality tends to be a fixed characteristic. Match quality tends to be a time-varying uh, characteristic that's determined um, independently. And uh, so it's not entirely crazy, but it's also not obvious that that implies that they're actually statistically independent. There are other things that I haven't mentioned, too. The, uh, in, in order to do these be for these benchmarking tests, I assumed that the, um, that the distributions, the, the match values were statistically independent of each other. And um, uh, an obvious question that you might ask is, well, suppose I have um, um, Two guys who are they, they know that you're both that you're interested in, in home refinancing and they're both mortgage refinancers. It could be that the top two bids go up together and the others uh, stay stay low. So this becomes an empirical question, and we actually have run some experiments to figure out the uh, what we can about the distributions. And uh, the experiments are um, well, they're good enough that this auction is going to be used. Um, the we, we we ran some tests and. Uh, Based on the test, this auction is going to be rolled out shortly. So, uh, so this auction will also be used in practice. OK? Thank you. Well, it's a strong assumption, but it's probably true. Um, the uh, yes, it's a strong assumption.